celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. I'm going to follow on last month's episode called Strengths of the Signs with this episode that I'm calling The Sign Behind. And it's going to kind of talk about those strengths and weaknesses of the signs and how they relate to the sign before or after. And it kind of is a relative term depending on how you look at it, so I'll explain what I mean. So the signs always proceed in a particular order through the zodiac, and we usually see them listed as Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and then Pisces. And we can think of those as sort of Sometimes we call them stages of development, but I'm talking today about how they stand in relation to one another. And this uses what we would talk about as the house grid or the 1 through 12 in a counterclockwise order. And it would start at what would be the position of 9 o'clock on a clock face. So we'll have an illustration here showing that 1 through 12. And whatever house you put at, I'm sorry, whatever sign you put at the first house position, the sign that precedes it in the zodiac will be the sign that we say is the sign behind it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it has a sort of 12th house flavor to the sign in question. Now, what are the first house and the 12th house? And this would apply to everybody in your chart no matter what your sun sign is, your rising sign, or anything else. But the first house is the department about the self. And it talks about your way of greeting the world. It's sort of where dawn occurs on the day's chart. It would be in the eastern horizon position. Or actually, the eastern horizon separates the first house from the twelfth house. And the twelfth house is above the horizon. Now, ironically, it sounds like the twelfth house should be oh, that's what's out in the open because it's above the horizon. It doesn't work out that way with what the uh, houses symbolize because the twelfth house is sort of like the last place or it has a feeling that relates to the last sign, which is the sign of Pisces. And this is a house that has to do with hidden things. It could be what's not in view because it's exactly behind us. Like if you know in military parlance, when they're trying to communicate with one another in the field and they want to say, well, what's right in front of you? That's what they call 12 o'clock. Or if it's at 3 o'clock or 9 o'clock, it's off to your sides. Well, 6 o'clock is what's exactly behind you and you can't see it. And that's why you'll sometimes hear them say, I got your 6 o'clock. I've got your back. I can see what's behind you, even though, you know, you don't have eyes in the back of your head and you can't see what's behind you. So the sign that's behind you is kind of what was either been there, done that, or it's like our unconscious. It's what we're not aware of. The first house is the house of the self. It's where we sort of burst into life and we have our sense of our own individuality. The twelfth house is that ocean of consciousness and of mankind that we come out of, but it's not where we have a sense of individuality. It's our sense of, oh, I'm just one little drop in the whole ocean of mankind. So it can have a spiritual connection, but it can also have a feeling of invisibility. And in fact, it's a house that talks about our want for privacy and where we want to be away and not be seen. Or sometimes it's things we're doing in secret. Um, I think about the Wizard of Oz and how the um, wizard was behind the curtain that Toto pulls. And he goes, oh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, sometimes we have our own inner man behind the curtain that we're not necessarily paying attention to. And this is going to be represented by that sign before or behind you. The earlier sign, but it's behind your back. So sometimes 
the strengths of that sign that's behind your back can be like the wind at your back and to push you forward and give you assistance. The worst traits of that sign will be more like a knife in your back or the way that you kind of trip over your own feet or shoot yourself in the foot. Actually, you know, Pisces that goes sort of with that house generically does happen to rule feet. Um, it's known as the house of self-undoing. Now that might just be the idea of it's the selfless place and it does have a lot to do with charitability and, you know, kind of giving things away. But it's also that place where you have no self or where your self disintegrates. Now when we have two signs next to each other, adjacent, they have nothing in common. There are certain attributes for each of the signs, like there's what we call polarity, yin and yang, or masculine, feminine, however you want to label it, but it alternates. You know, if you've got a yang sign with Aries, you've got a yin sign with Taurus, you've got a yang sign with Gemini, you've got a yin sign with Cancer, and so on through the, the zodiac order. Then we have the attribute called element that most people have heard of, fire, earth, air, water. There's four elements, three in each sign, I mean, eight, three signs in each element, so you won't have adjacent signs in the same element and obviously not the same polarity. And the other attribute we talk about is called mode or quality, and those three are cardinal, meaning attack things head on or confront, fixed, stand your ground, and mutable, kind of dodge and weave, adaptability, flexibility. So adjacent signs don't have that in common either. And therefore, there's kind of no point of connection. When we go around the circle from that position number one, we'll have connections to things that are in the third house, not the second. Okay, because that's adjacent. Yep. Well, some of the unconnected houses or how many signs apart it would be for not such a strong connection. One sign apart is tough and five signs apart is tough. The five is sort of one off from the opposition, which can be a counterbalance or a clash. But the one when we call that like a disconnect, five signs apart, it's called quincunx, which probably has a root word with the quin being five, but it's also known as the inconjunct, the not conjunct. Conjunct means in the same place or in the same sign usually. So this one sign apart, where the twelfth house is from the first, is another disconnected house. At least it has a touching point because it is adjacent. And you will find many couples that have, you know, their sun signs are one sign apart. But I think what's working there is not that they have something in common, really, but that you're likely to have a planet like Mercury or Venus in the sign next to your sign anyway. So they might have something in each other's signs to give them a connection. Now, I may have mentioned to you over the course of this show something called progressions that show the progress we make in this life. And what that means is it's a symbolic system of updating your chart. It goes from your birthday and each day after your birthday in your birth year is symbolically representative of the consecutive years of your life. And it's like you make progress through your life. And in that sense, whatever you start off with as your sun sign, whatever you start off with as your rising sign, you're going to progress or grow into the next sign, the sign after that, depends on how long you live, maybe the sign after that. You know, 30 degrees per sign is going to be about 30 years for the sun to progress through a sign. So by the time you come to adulthood, you've experienced something of those very different qualities of the sign next to yours, and you've incorporated some of those traits and behavior. But that sign that was behind you, it's just being left further and further behind. Or you look at it with some different perspectives. Okay, so let us think about 
these signs in relation to one another. And we have an illustration we're going to put up to help you picture this. And each time you have um, the sign that you put at the first house, it could be your sun sign. And if that's the case, the rest of the signs in zodiac order are going to show you what a solar chart looks like. And those are your solar houses or your signs of your solar houses. And that has some validity even if you do know your birth time. If you know your birth time, you can find out what your rising sign is. It's the sign that was coming up on the eastern horizon at the time of your birth. If you're born around dawn, it's the same as your sun sign. The sun's dawning, rising in your sign. If you're born at sunset, it's the sign opposite. If you're born around noontime, it's three signs later. If you're born around midnight, it's three signs before your sun sign. So you can kind of get that feel. But throughout the day, these houses and the house grid depend on the direction. So as the earth turns on its axis, and for a 24-hour period, we kind of aim at each of the 12 signs for about two hours. So those are the times that the signs rise. So if you know your rising sign, when you listen to this explanation, think in terms of your rising sign. <clears throat> If you don't, it's okay to just think in terms of your sun sign and think in terms of that anyway because it has some validity. I'm just going to have a little sip of water. You could probably hear my voice was getting a little quieter. And um, anyway, I needed that sip. We all need water sometimes. <clears throat> so we'll start with Aries because that's where we usually start. And if Aries is the sign at the first house, it says, my main impetus is to be an individual, and I want to be outstanding in some way, and I want to you know, show myself with confidence. What's behind my back? It's Pisces. That might mean if I have faith in myself and use some of the high qualities of Pisces, visionary, imagination, things like that, it can help me be a stronger me. If the low side of Pisces is coming out, it's going to be fears or it's going to be projection and blaming other people. It's like, you have these bad qualities. I don't have these. But, you know, projection, it's a psychological condition where when we can't see something in ourselves, we only see it in other people. So that's something that can happen with any of the signs regarding what that 12th house sign is. Pisces probably just ends up getting a little bit more of that. They seem to be sort of the screen onto which a lot of people project their stuff. Pisces, emotional sign. It's in the water element. It's a dodgy sign. It's in the mutable quality. Well, Aries is all about action and confrontation and says, I don't want to be haunted by this feeling of I can't decide, or I'm wishy-washy, or I'm one way in one situation and another way in another situation which on the plus side, we'd call that flexibility. But any quality or attribute can be an asset or a liability depending on how it's used. And that's kind of what I want you to get as a message from this today, is that this sign that's behind you, it can either, like I say, be the wind at your back or it can be the knife in your back. So if we look at Taurus, Taurus is a fixed sign. It wants stability. In fact, it gets into ruts if it doesn't watch out. And it's leery of that Aries energy that says, oh, leap first and look later. It's like, no, Taurus is too cautious for that. Or patient. Taurus will let things come to them instead of trying to push the envelope. So when we see those traits of the sign behind us, we feel like that's what's going to get me in trouble. If I'm too quick and hasty with something, or just fly by the seat of my pants and I don't have any kind of plan, or I don't you know, have it grounded, like the earth sign Taurus wants, in my values, then that's what I'm going to get in trouble with. But actually, some of the better attributes of Aries, if the Taurus person will incorporate that, will say, okay, I have some bravado or confidence, or you know, when I come from my experience of knowing who I am, which is Aries, and our experience should be sort of what's behind us, then I can act in consistency with my values. So we come to Gemini. 
Gemini is one of these mutable sort of dodge signs. And it wants to be flexible. And it feels the weight of Taurus behind it as being too stuck in the mud and holding Gemini's fleety flying self back. And Gemini's more of a superficial sign. Or let's say it looks at things on the surface. I think also the other air sign, Libra, tends to do that a lot too. Maybe not so much Aquarius, the other air sign. But at any rate, when you're Gemini, you want to have your logic working as your strongest trait. And Taurus tends to go more for what's safe. Where will I fe feel secure? That might get along with what your logic is telling you. Maybe sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so then we come to Cancer. Cancer would have Gemini as the sign behind its back. I'm going to use my pen to mark this so I don't forget where I am. Cancer is a water sign. It wants to be emotion-based and do everything by feel. And it says, oh, kind of what's behind me or what can be my trouble is too much logic. You know, if I hear too many voices in my head or, you know, I'm changing my opinion. I'm one way one day and another way another day, which is very Gemini. That doesn't sit right with me. Or I'd rather go with what am I in the mood for rather than what makes sense or what people are telling me to do. So Cancer likes that mood. Cancer's also more apt to do direct confrontation the way cardinal sign Aries will do and not like the wishy-washiness of the mutable sign that is at its back. So if we were to say what's the plus of Gemini that can help out Cancer? Well, if the Cancer will accept some of the logic of Gemini and also use Gemini's curiosity to say, let me listen, let me look, let me use my senses, my eyes and my ears to figure something out or ask questions, you know, like Columbo would always ask the questions. Then I can see how does that fit with my feelings and put them both together. Now, if Leo is the sign that we're going to talk about as if we're putting it at the first house, the twelfth house from Leo, the sign behind, is Cancer. Well, Leo wants regal strength and doesn't want to appear to be weak and too emotional the way that Cancer would be. And there's nothing wrong with emotions. It's just, you know, what are you oriented towards displaying? Well, Leo's main display wants to be pride, ego, almost cockiness, and sometimes a little, mm, not a little, it's a lot focused on the self, but I was going to say almost like too much focused on the self. Well, that's a matter of taste or judgment. But both Aries and Leo are very self-oriented. The Sun, which is the center of the solar system, rules Leo. So think of the Sun King. The Sun is said to be exalted or operate at its best in Aries, the sign of the individual and the self. So in both cases, here are fire signs that have water as the sign behind them. And this is true with all of the elements. There's a certain element that precedes a certain um, other element. So let me see, I had that list here. And I did want to go over that a little bit. Like here we're talking about how water always precedes fire. So we have to kind of come from a place of feeling or make peace with our feelings in order to take action, which is very fiery. Then fire precedes earth. Action will have tangible results. Earth always precedes air. So when we know what the facts are, then we can use our mind to make decisions. And air always precedes water. So usually there's some kind of communication or information that triggers an emotion. So you can kind of see how that pattern works a little bit. So when we see Leo, they're reluctant to show their soft, vulnerable side. They don't want to act like they have needs. They want to seem like they're self-sufficient because it's such a strong sign of the self. The plus side of Cancer would be to have a little compassion, have some nurturing that you're willing to add to 
your regalness so that you are like the benevolent king or queen. Now when we come to Virgo at the first house, the twelfth house sign behind it is Leo. Virgos tend toward humility, simplicity, and they see that aggrandizement and flashiness of the Leo as being something distasteful to them. Or like, oh, if I start showing off too much here, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Well, maybe you only get yourself in trouble with yourself, Virgo, because you're so self-critical and you want everything to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, well, you better not put it in the spotlight for everybody to see it. But if you take some of that confidence and creativity and risk-taking that will come with Leo and hand that to the Virgo, the wind at Virgo's back becomes that ability to not be afraid to shine, to have some confidence, to say, well, I've got competency in here. I've excelled at this before, and now I can go out and kind of show my stuff. Because Virgos do like to be good at what they do. You know, they like to get the hundred on the test or whatever it is, but, you know, they are very perfectionistic. But they don't like to get braggy about it. Now, when we come to Libra as the first house sign, the twelfth house would be Virgo. So Libra wants to be in balance, wants to connect with other people, wants to be popular, wants to be liked and loved. Some of that Virgo energy is very picky, critical, pointing out what's wrong with everybody else and maybe also with oneself. But that's where a Libra can feel like, oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble if I'm acting like the Virgo, if I'm criticizing everybody else instead of being a congenial team player. Libra also has the difficulty of weighing and balancing, deliberation, trying to make a decision, and they can come off as very indecisive. And here's where maybe Virgo can help out and say, well, here we've analyzed, because that's Virgo's strong suit, analyzed all of these possibilities and assessed which is the most perfect or which is the best, and then that can help in the decisiveness. Mm, and we might also say another good quality of Virgo is helpfulness. May I be of service? And that blends nicely with Libra wanting to be liked or wanting to get along with people. So there are ways that, you know, the sign before almost like aspires towards the next sign because that's what it's going to progress into. And so it looks at those traits as being desirable and you know, maybe it's only in the rearview mirror where we go, oh, I, I, don't, I don't want that. I, I want to move past that to the next sign, you know? So when we come to Scorpio, the sign behind is Libra. Scorpio is very much about go deep. Have your feelings. They're going to help transform you. And Libra is much more on the surface. It doesn't really want to look that deep. Because when you look deep, or you even look beneath the pretty cover of the book, you might see some contents that you don't like so much. Well, Scorpio's down here. It's a private sign. It's saying, I'm going to hide those to you anyway. You're not going to see them. But Scorpio, as that sort of fixed and determined sign that wants to get to the finish line, as does Taurus, Leo, and Aquarius, the other fixed signs, and Libra, as a cardinal sign, is a starter. Maybe doesn't finish everything that it gets started. So the Scorpio at the first would look to the twelfth of Libra and go, oh, you're always starting things and we don't get these things finished. Or you're just floating along on the surface and not going to the depth. Now where some of the good qualities of Libra can help Scorpio is to say diplomacy, tact, whereas Scorpio can be mm, sometimes cutthroat or even in a worst case scenario vengeful and Libra would try to say you know there might be a way you can address that hurt or imbalance or wrong that was done to you in a way that won't break the relationship will preserve it because Scorpio many times is willing to like you know pull the cord and cut and run if not run, get away from whatever, you know, they want to put in their rearview mirror. And Libra would say, wait, maybe there's something here that's still to be salvaged from this relationship. 
Mm, what else? Libra wants to do the middle road. Scorpio is a planet of extremes. So Scorpio can look at that Libra energy and say, oh, that's going to take me away from either the highs or the lows that I'm aiming towards. Well, you don't aim towards your lows, but you, you know, like the manic depressive. You like the manic, but the depressive part came as part of the package with it. And Scorpio could do with learning how to go more towards the middle and not be always living out on the edges. So we come to Sagittarius, and Scorpio is now the 12th house sign to Sagittarius. Sag wants variety. Scorpio is content with some things to be kind of steady state, or it's a fixed sign. It gets entrenched into things. Mostly what it is is it has a hard time letting go. It is the sign that is supposed to be about taking out the trash, but sometimes there's the hoarding that goes on first. So Sagittarius is generally the most optimistic of signs, kind of light and breezy and doesn't let anything bother it. You know, what do we say? Water off the duck's back. Scorpio has got the resentful, holds on to things forever. So that's where Sag will look at that and say, oh, I can't be holding on to those feelings. I've got to move on and let those go. Okay. So I see we have to hurry up just a little here. Um, Capricorn has Sag behind it. It wants conformity. It wants achievement. It's very serious. The Sag side is very humorous and, um, you know, scattered instead of plowing on down towards the plan. Then we come to Aquarius with Capricorn behind it. Aquarius wants renovation or innovation. And Capricorn is... Nope, this is the established way of doing things. Can't be having that. But you can see how the plus of an established way of doing things is, well, you won't get too far afield if you remember what the norms are. And now we, if we have Pisces with the sign behind it as Aquarius, you want the feelings. You want the sort of transcendal, transcendent connection with everybody. And Aquarius is sometimes aloof. It's an air sign. It wants breathing space. It doesn't want to be so locked in and bound, bind, bind it, bound with other people. So what I want to encourage you to do is to see that every sign has a plus, a minus. We can actually incorporate any of those into us, but we're particularly looking at what is either the wind behind our back or the knife in our back. And we want to see how can we use the pluses of that sign behind in order to go forward. So we'll have another interesting topic next month. And stay tuned for Looking Up.